Every five years, the Barnega Bay Partnership publishes a State of the Bay report looking at current conditions throughout the watershed. This report compares current conditions with those identified in the past so that we can assess all the collective efforts that are taking place to protect and restore the Barnega Bay, an estuary of national significance. So exactly how does one assess the condition of the bay? In some ways, it's not unlike a trip to your doctor for an annual physical. Your doctor asks a lot of questions about your overall health, looks at your appearance, checks out any past problems, measures your vital signs. 225. 319. 91 male calendar. 64. 103.3. Take some samples. Order some tests. How much pressure five pounds puts on this amount of area in the marsh? Salinity is 0 0.03. does some analysis. In this instance, there's no mosquito ditching that we see from the aerial shots. Like this guy down here hardly has any, this one has more. So what we have here are a female and male chub sucker. Reviews the results with other experts. Then a plan is developed. Regular exercise. A better diet. Less stress. To address the problems and ensure your well-being. As part of the plan to protect and restore the Barnega Bay, the Barnega Bay National Estuary Program was established as a follow-up to state-funded studies and assessments of the bay. Its first plan, called a Comprehensive Conservation and Management Plan, or CCMP, was developed to identify the challenges in the bay and the priorities for fixing them. For the past 15 years, we have generally followed this plan. But the plan back then didn't include sea level rise, jellyfishes, climate change, or Sandy. We have cleaned up Sandy's wreckage as best we can and are busy rebuilding our communities and waterfront neighborhoods drowned by the storm. In the past five years, we also learned more about the Barnegat Bay than in any period in the Bay's history. We now have a better understanding of the Bay's major problems. So now is the time for us to revisit the Bay's condition and review our plans to address those problems, and make sure we are focused on what's important. Our biggest concern in 2011, eutrophication, remains the most serious challenge today. So what is eutrophication? Eutrophication is a process that leads to excessive growth in the bay, phytoplankton blooms, mats of drift algae, growth of encrusting organisms on seagrass, the slime on the bottom of the bay, nutrient runoff from the watershed, warming water temperatures, certain water circulation patterns, and other factors all can contribute to this process. And as the bay itself changes and more people move here to live and work, eutrophication will remain a challenge, but we have taken some small but important first steps that should help us address it. Our 2011 State of the Bay report also identified many critical information gaps. Back then, we did not have enough data to identify some conditions or trends in a number of the indicators of the Bay's health. If you don't know the trends, you can't tell if you're fixing the problem. The 17 indicators used in the 2016 State of the Bay report are representative of the Bay's habitats, resources, and various human stressors that come with different types of land use. They are specific and measurable characteristics, so they can be used to assess changes, good or bad, in key conditions over time. Let's look at some of the key indicators. No matter what indicator in this report is being considered, many of our daily activities can have a variety of local environmental impacts, good or bad. Everything we do on the land, as we live, work, and play, potentially affects the state of the bay. Despite the slowdown in some activities due to Sandy and the regional economy, land development and the alteration of the landscape have both continued to increase since we last reported in 2011. The latest land area statistics in 2012 showed that of the 348,000 acres making up the watershed, more than a third, over 121,000 acres, have been altered by humans. But there is some good news. 
Through a variety of public and private partnerships, open space preservation continues throughout the watershed, with over 11,000 acres protected over the past five years, close to 5,000 of those in 2015 alone. Protected, undeveloped lands provide important habitats for wildlife and opportunities for recreational and educational activities that contribute to our economy. They enhance water quality, buffer us from flooding, and allow rainwater to soak into the ground, putting back some of that fresh water we're taking out of our underground aquifers. Many groups have worked hard and invested heavily to acquire and protect open space. However, it's clear that acquiring open space alone is not enough to address the adverse impacts of our current land use activities. Eutrophication, the excessive production driven by high nutrient loads to the bay, continues to be the major problem in the Barnegat Bay, just as it was five years ago. While estuaries are among the most productive ecosystems on the planet, the high nutrient loads can result in the undesirable growth of algae and nuisance phytoplankton, which oftentimes leads to a cascade of other problems in the ecosystem. The decay of the algae and eelgrass observed around the bay can lead to low oxygen levels, which can literally suffocate fishes and shellfishes, or drive the fish to other areas. But our indicators show we are not seeing this low dissolved oxygen effect in the Barnegat Bay at this time. In addition to nutrients, the report also looks at some other potential problems. We looked at the turbidity of the water, how cloudy is it? What's making the water hazy? Storms, algae blooms, erosion? Overall, our turbidity is average and changes are based primarily on weather conditions and water flow. However, we do have some local turbidity hotspots that need to be corrected. We also took a look at pathogens in the water, those bacteria that can cause disease. Water testing at beaches and shellfish grounds is done regularly during the summer months to make sure the water is safe to swim in and shellfish are safe to eat. Here the news is better than five years ago. There has been a decrease in the number of beach closings and shellfish harvesting restrictions have not increased. An important and growing concern is whether we have enough clean water for use in our homes and businesses that can support our quality of life. We are taking out far more fresh water for our homes, our yards, our businesses than we are putting back in. In addition to just the water supply, we also looked at how water is moving through the system. When our lawns become hard and compacted, when we mismanage storm water, we alter how rainwater feeds into our streams and decrease the amount of time it takes to move through the ecosystem. This creates a rush of water into our streams that is far different than if it soaked through the forest floor and traveled through the ground to replenish and maintain stream flow. This imbalance impacts our rivers and streams, significantly affects the water quality of our waterways, and changes the habitats of many of the bay's species. The Barnegat Bay watershed is home to some of the most unique and distinctive habitats on Earth. From the fire-adapted upland forests of the Pinelands, our nation's first national reserve, to the diverse coastal habitats of the Edwin B. Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge, recognized as one of the most important stopover points for migratory birds in North America. Our freshwater and tidal wetlands and salt marshes provide critical protection against flooding rivers, storm surge, and rising seas. They process nutrients and trap sediments, both of which affect the bay's water quality. These habitats support commercially and recreationally important fishes and shellfishes, crucial to our coastal economy. But coastal wetlands, salt marshes, and other habitats are under increasing threats from climate change and sea level rise. Wetlands continue to be lost throughout the watershed, but the rate at which they were lost and converted to developed lands did slow during the past five years. Most tidal wetlands in the bay are moderately to severely stressed and have an uncertain future. Seagrasses are a critical nursery habitat for many of the fishes and shellfishes we like to catch ourselves or pick up at the local fish market. They continue to struggle to recover from historic lows, but there have been some small improvements in certain parts of the bay. The distribution of our two species of seagrass appears to be changing, but the effects on the bay's fish and wildlife species are yet unknown. Surveys for hard clams in the estuary found the population is severely depleted compared to the mid-1980s. However, we are seeing more hard clams in Little Lake Harbor since low numbers recorded back in 2001. The fish community in the northern and central segments of the bay remains diverse, consisting of a number of resident and tourist species those that use the bay during the warmer months. 
our indicators show the bay's fish community has been relatively stable over the past five years, while various southern species are caught sporadically around the bay in summer. So what's next? The Barnegat Bay Partnership is now revising our Comprehensive Conservation and Management Plan, or CCMP, to address the challenges in the bay and the priorities for fixing them, examining and updating our action plans to make sure we are focused on what's most important, and assessing our communication tools to effectively share that information with you. We need people like you to be involved in all these processes. We need the insight and feedback you can provide as the folks who live, work, and recreate in the Barnegat Bay and its watershed. If you would like to get more involved, please go to our website, bbp.ocean.edu, for more information on the state of the bay and how you can participate in upcoming BBP events. All of us can act as a stressor to the bay or by choices we make as a leader in its protection. Join us as a leader.